Okay, it's 1.35 p.m. and I think it's time to start the session. I hope you can uh, uh, hear me clearly. Uh, when I tested this earlier, it seemed to work quite well. Um, uh, what I'm here to tell you about today, and I have to get my control panel up here in front of me, um, is my, my talk is titled Kill the Data Format Problem. Uh, using Apache Daffodil, which is an incubator project that uh, I think is very exciting and we're, I'm, I'm going to tell you more about. Um, my, uh, you can see my, my uh, company name. Some of you know me from working for a company named Traces in the past, but uh, Traces has been rebranded OWL, hence the two uh, affectionately known as the Nerdbirds uh, owls on my slide. Um, uh, thank you for listening today. Um, so what is Daffodil about? What do I mean by kill the data format problem? Well, the data format problem is this. Imagine you've got Edifact data. Edifact is a, a very common data standard. It's used in um, electronic data interchange. Think, you know, supply chain, things of that sort. Um, it's a big standard. There's lots of complexity to this, and it also gets customized in various ways by the people who use it. So it's it's not one of these things where you can just get an Edifact software package. It actually will require some tweaking. Um, so Edifact is a good example of a, of a data format that you may find that you ultimately have to deal with. Uh, another common thing people run into is some data formats that have been very carefully packed to use every bit. So all the little bit flags are, uh, are individually identified and they're packed into the bytes very densely. Um, this is, um, uh, in many cases, these formats are old and they date from when bandwidth was not so uh, available as it is nowadays. But it, these are kind of things also come up in big data situations. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from the big data world was, uh, comes from a data warehousing project where the manager of the project told me, if you make that record one byte bigger, I have to buy 22 disk drives. So in many cases, it's important to pack the data. So you can end up with these kinds of densely packed things that you need to take apart in order to manipulate. Um, NACHA is another um, Im important data format. NACHA data is for credit card transactions. Uh, and it looks textual here, but uh, this is, there's, it's not textual in the typical sense. There's no line endings in this data, for example. So it's one giant long line. It just happens that all the data values in it are textual. Um, so pulling uh, NACHA data apart is another typical problem that uh, is easy, easily solved with Daffodil. Um, here's another one, ISO 8583. This is another credit card related data standard, but this one's binary data. Even though most of it looks like text on your screen right here, there are some pieces in here that actually, uh, there are characters uh, in here that really uh, aren't normal printing characters in this data. They're actually binary fields. There's bit flags in here, uh, all kinds of things. So ISO 85A3 is another credit card transaction data type, very popular, very commonly used, and, uh, and hard to deal with without some way of, of describing this format to your software. So that's what Daffodil is about, solving these kinds of data situations. You've got this kind of data, you need to read it, you need to write it, uh, because you have to integrate with systems that use this kind of data, uh, they consume it, they produce it. Um, so Daffodil uh, is named Daffodil, uh, spelled out like the flower daffodils, uh, but it's, it's really a play on the, the, the name of the language it implements, which is called Data Format Description Language, or DFDL. And we just decided you can pronounce DFDL daffodil. Um, but there is a distinction. There is Apache daffodil, the incubating software package, uh, and there's DFDL, the language. Uh, and um, so a couple important things about DFDL. DFDL is a way of describing data formats. It's not a data format, right? So uh, there's lots of, of uh, useful data formats out there in the world, and Apache has a bunch of them. Avro is one of the ones I hear about a lot. 
Um, those, are, those are data formats. They're not ways of describing data formats. DFDL serves a different role. You don't, it's for projects and situations where you don't get to choose the data format. The data format's already been chosen for you. Now you have to describe it to your software. Um, now, DFDL, the language, is actually an open standard uh, that's emerging from a, a little known group called the Open Grid Forum. Uh, it's been, been worked on for quite a few years. I actually started working on DFDL in the early 2000s. Um, and I uh, co-chair the standards committee on DFDL. We're hoping that the final specification of this will come out in the first half of next year. Um, there's draft specifications available right now. There, uh, the, besides the Apache uh, Daffodil Incubator implementation of, of DFDL, there are two other uh, implementations out there. IBM, actually IBM has several of its own implementations of DFDL, uh, including ones that run on mainframes, one that run on general computing systems, one's written in Java, one's written in C. Um, there's also uh, an interesting DFDL implementation from the European Space Agency that was uh, specifically set up for dealing with the binary data feeds from satellites. So uh, it's quite interesting that there's these other implementations out there as well. Um, now, uh, so what um, uh, DFDL standards essentially emerged as a standardization effort trying to take a union of all the capabilities across a whole bunch of the integration products and tools that were in the marketplace uh, in the in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Um, and the, we did a standard for this stuff in order to uh, get adequate adoption of, uh, of the standard instead of every data tool in the world having its own little data description technique. Because every Everything that needs to bring in data ends up growing a little bit of a daffodil-like thing in order to describe certain kinds of data, but they're usually not complete enough uh, and uh, powerful enough. And DFDL is quite powerful, quite capable, and really represents the union of what you see across the marketplace of data integration products and tools for intake and export of data. So using daffodil, you recall that some of that data I showed you in the first few slides, you can uh, have your NACHA data as JSON. So here it is as JSON. This is the same piece of data. Of course, it doesn't fit on one slide, um, uh, but uh, JSON is, of course, an extremely popular standard right now. Um, but yeah, of course, you might want it as XML. Same data, NACHA data, but now I've, I've converted it into XML. Um, so Daffodil will bidirectionally convert data from uh, native formats to and from JSON, XML, and other things, as I'll show you. Um, so to give you um, an idea how this works, I'm going to, in just four slides, create a tiny little DFDL schema. A DFDL schema is the, the, uh, the thing that is a format description. We call it a schema. Um, and uh, I'll show you a teeny little example here. So here's some delimited text data, okay? This is a, a completely made up example, but um, it's got a couple of numbers in it, and it's got these tag-like things, uh, uh, R-limit and RPNGX, telling us what these data fields are. Um, so um, the first thing is the, um, you can see there's a couple of, it, there's a couple numbers in here. One's an integer. One's a floating point number. Uh, and then there's the other stuff around it. Uh, in DFDL language, these tag-like structures are called initiators. Uh, there's a separator separating the two uh, numeric fields here, which is this semicolon in the middle. Uh, and then there's a, the second field, of course, also has its initiator. So those are the characteristics of this particular data format. Now, the red part that I've shown here is uh, in daffodil speak is what we call framing, and the black is what we call content. Um, these separators and initiators um, are delimiters, uh, which are part of the framing. Um, these are just some of the terms that you find in, in daffodil. Uh, so DFDL schemas use XML schema. You basically use XML schema as a grammar scaffolding. 
So our, our little uh, piece of data had two elements in it, which I've created a, a complex type here. I've decided since their names began with R to call them the R values. Uh, so this little pair of data looks like this in XML schema. Uh, this, right now, this is XML schema. It's not a DFDL schema yet. It's just describing the logical elements. Their R limit element uh, uh, is an integer. The RPNGX, whatever that stands for, is a floating point number. Um, so to make this into a DFDL schema, we add these annotations to that schema. The, at the top here, we have a block of format annotation that uh, covers things that apply to the entire schema, which often is much bigger than a little definition like this. But uh, so this is representation text, textual data as opposed to binary data. Uh, it has standard text numbers, which means the numbers are made up of the usual digits. Its encoding is the ASCII character set. Um, the length kind is delimited. Um, so uh, there's a number of different ways the length of data can be determined. Uh, and then those apply across the entire uh, schema. But then I decorate also the specific uh, complex type here for my R values with the properties directly on it that are particular to its uh, intricacies, like the sequence of two elements, they're separated by a semicolon. You can see that the uh, in R limit and RPNGX elements each have an initiator, which uh, is, this is uh, listed here. Uh, these things are called uh, DFDL properties. In particular, these are what we call format properties. Now, once you've got a DFDL schema uh, uh, for your data, then uh, it's off to the races. Now, that data, the schema here is in the middle of my picture um, and is used both by parsing and the inverse of parsing, which we call unparsing in daffodil speak. So the, um, the data, of course, can be parsed by daffodil and it creates this tree-like structure you see at the bottom, called, which we call the daffodil info set. Uh, and that uh, info set uh, can be projected then to and from JSON or XML, as you saw in the example slides. Um, it can be directly transferred, uh, tra uh, projected into Apache NiFi records, which I'll talk about a little bit more, uh, or other data processing frameworks that have their own sort of native ways of carrying around data. Uh, you can also start from any of those formats, create an info set, and then go the inverse pathway and unparse it to get the data in text or binary formats. Uh, so uh, you now, so the schema can be written so that it both supports parsing and unparsing. It's possible to write schemas that only support parsing or only support unparsing if that's all you need. But most schemas uh, are um, going to try to capture everything about the data format so that they're highly reusable uh, for both parsing and serializing or unparsing uh, the data format. A um, quick note on the term unparse, which does bother some people. We use the term unparse because the, the common other terms for this are marshalling or serialization. And both of those connote a, um, uh, a serial process that we didn't really want to talk about in the DFDL standard. Um, it's possible, for example, using DFDL to build a thing that doesn't access to data. Uh, so in which case, when you're quote unquote on parsing or it would actually be writing a, a chunk of data. Uh, so uh, the directions here are parse and unparse in some sense and that's why we coined the term unparse. So uh, so the, the next question that comes up of course is if I can parse data and I can unparse data, great. Uh, where do these schemas come from? And the answer is you can write them or you can get them. Uh, and there's sort of three kinds of, or two kind of ways you can get them. You can find them published. Um, there's quite a few that are available on um, GitHub. Most of these are on GitHub uh, or will be soon, some of the new ones. Every time I show this slide, it's obsolete by the time I show it. Um, so there's, a, there's quite a bunch of them and they cover everything from images 
and credit card data and uh, Edifact and some point of sale things. And uh, there's a few, quite a few um, that have to do with uh, mapping and imagery. There's quite a few that have to do with avionics. Uh, Asterix is one, 29, uh, AFTN flight plan. So there's quite a few that, um, uh, uh, that cover different, different areas that are available and they're great to use as starting points for learning about DFDL schema writing. Um, there's quite a few that have to do with military uh, data formats, uh, which is for me personally, and I'll actually talk about that a little bit more uh, uh, in the, the use case uh, of, of cybersecurity, which is what my company does and is the motivation for my company's interest in Apache Daffodil and why we're interested in contributing to it. Um, there are also schemas available under commercial license uh, for these really large and complex data formats, you know, HL7, for example, or uh, USMTF. These are big, complicated things. It's not that easy to, to create one and, uh, and just publish it uh, for free. Uh, they require support and so forth. So some, some schemas are available for commercial license. So there's, there's quite a, a, an ecosystem sort of starting to grow around building uh, DFDL schemas for important data types. Um, so, um, so I wanna come back to the theme of killing the data format problem. So we've got this system that I've talked about, Apache Daffodil there and this, um, uh, and this standard. And that's really about the strategy we have for trying to kill the data format problem, which is, you really do need two things to kill the data format problem. You need an open standard language that everyone can have a of and that has multiple implementations that interoperate um, and with sponsors uh, behind it, uh, which includes um, IBM as well as uh, the US DOD and Canada DND. Um, the primary use case for this is cybersecurity, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that use case in the next couple of slides. But I think nowadays, if you don't, you 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 want to solve a real problem for our industry, you have to build a high quality open source implementation, um, and it has to have a community of developers. Uh, you can have available commercial support, which my company does provide for people, um, and that's the role Apache Daffodil plays, which is that it uh, it ensures that people can have free access not only to the standard but to an implementation of the standard, uh, so they can get off the ground using it quickly and easily. Uh, with a high quality piece of software. Now, I wanted to talk about the um, the use case, uh, the cybersecurity use case, because people uh, often ask me why, uh, what Daffodil has to do per se with cybersecurity. So the, um, the, the cybersecurity use case is what we call bad data denial of service, bad data DOS. Um, so, what you see here is a little picture of a firewall and you have some high threat network on the left, like the internet, um, and you have a secure network on the other side of the firewall. Maybe that's your application servers, your database backends, whatever it is. And the firewall is of course supposed to be protecting one from the other. Now uh, this yellow circle here is uh, depicting a piece of data that says it's of some format, which I'm calling format X. For, and, uh, so the question that the firewall has to answer, the firewall may be very demanding. It may say whitelist. I only allow data to go across this firewall if it is of one of the recognized formats. But how does it really know if that data is of format X and won't crash the applications once it gets over onto the secure network side? I mean, what if this data is just pretending to be format X, has the right magic number and the right file extension and all those things, and looks at the beginning to be format X, but it's actually bad data, right? So how is a firewall going to do this better so that it can rule out the pretenders? Well, so the cybersecurity, the reason we're using Daffodil is roughly speaking like this. The data says it's format X. Well, let's prove it's format X. The way we do that is we parse it using a DFDL schema for format X. We get out an info set, which can be validated and so forth and scrutinized. Then we unparse it back to its native format. 
So when the data comes out the other side of the firewall, it is proven to be Format X by construction. It is Format X for sure now. And if it can't survive this process, then it was bad data. So that's the cyber, essentially, in a nutshell, there's a lot more nuances to it, of course, but that's the cybersecurity use case uh, for, uh, for FDL and Apache Daffodil is uh, you, need, you need, of course, schemas for all the kinds of data that you want to have across the firewall, uh, but you don't have packages for every kind of data that crosses the firewall. Um, now, I want to talk uh, quickly Daffodil because the purpose of this library is to be integrated into other software packages that provide the manipulation fabrics for data of all kinds. So one of the ones that's popular is Apache NiFi and we have uh, now a, what I call a native integration and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides. Um, we have an Apache Spark integration that uses, uh, converts data to XML and hands it off as XML to Spark. I'd like to upgrade that to a native one. Um, there's an XProc engine, which is a XML transformation pipeline tool called Calabash. There's a Daffodil integration for that. A company called Software AG has done an integration with their product called Integration Server, which you might have heard of. It used to be called Web Methods. Um, our, my company's products embed uh, Apache Daffodil. Other companies' products are embedding uh, Apache Daffodil. Um, there's a lot of uh, important potential for native integrations into a variety of the processing fabrics and utilities that we have in the Apache Software Foundation projects. Uh, Spark, Flink, Beam, Hadoop, I, all these things can benefit tremendously from using DFDL. Uh, and Daffodil to provide access to the kinds of data that are otherwise quite hard for them to cope with. So let me talk quickly about um, NiFi, just as an example of how uh, an integration works. So uh, I realize this diagram isn't that easy to read, but on the left, you, there's a Daffodil parsing. Um, this was a little example flow we built. It's actually parsing PCAP data, which is rel relatively easy to parse. Um, uh, and feeding it through and unparsing it again on the other side, uh, and there's a transformation in between. So um, the question is, what moves on the arcs between the daffodil parse component and the transform component? Um, and the and recently a, a direct native data and metadata bridge has been built for NiFi. So this bypasses all the XML and JSON overheads. Basically, you have two parts to this thing. There's a metadata bridge, which runs essentially at, at compile time or startup time of the job. Uh, and that is able to project a DFDL schema into a native NiFi record schema, uh, allowing, uh, so it's a metadata mapping. And then, of course, at runtime, the data bridge converts the DFDL info set tree in directly into a NiFi record, a native NiFi record. Uh, and so that the data can be carried through uh, NiFi flow in the most efficient way, uh, which is NiFi's own native record format. A uh, similar kind of native integration with these two parts, the metadata bridge and the data bridge, uh, can be done for any of the big data frameworks. Um, they, they, all, they, have a, they all have some sort of way of native carrying structure for data. Uh, and uh, the metadata bridge and the data bridge can be built for those, and then they would have a native, they would have a native adapter, adapter to anything described. Um, okay, so um, popping up to sort of uh, procedural things, Daffodil's an incubator project, right? Now for three years, since September 2017. We've had seven Apache releases. Um, by the way, this code base is written in Scala. Um, it runs on the Java virtual machines. It has a Java API, of course. Um, the status of our project is community building. We believe we're ready for new developers. There's some new developers that have come on board this year. There's a lot of beginner tickets out there available for people to get started. A bunch of interesting new areas for people to contribute to. Um, the reason we're still uh, podling, still in the incubator, is because the, we need more developers from a more diverse group of companies. Uh, Apache uh, Software Foundation's guidance, of course, is top-level projects need to have viability 
even if a company decides they no longer want to contribute. There needs to be enough other companies involved that the project is viable and not just something that lives or dies with one company's interest. So, um, so that's where we are in community building. I'm quite optimistic that sometime in the next uh, six months or so, we're going to have enough to be able to graduate. Uh, keeping my fingers crossed on that. I, um, I've seen some new contributors from another whole company just in the last 48 hours. So that's kind of exciting. Um, so uh, there's some um, cool new ideas. Uh, here's where I'm going to start advertising about why I want you guys who are developers or are interested in this to um, get involved in the Daffodil Project. Uh, so one of the things we're doing with Daffodil is we're extending it to have a sort of uh, SAC style event streaming capability that allows it to handle it fits in memory. This is partly done, not entirely done yet, uh, but it's an exciting capability because in many cases people have gigantic pieces of data uh, uh, that they want to uh, cross, uh, they want to use Daffodil to process. Um, the, I already mentioned the integration with, um, with NiFi, uh, integration with other big data frameworks and data tools in the Apache uh, community are, of course, exciting because they immediately bring the uh, benefits of using Daffodil to uh, uh, the community of people using that particular framework. So we want to do more of those. Um, there's an exciting project which kind of got kicked off uh, two years ago. Um, uh, but is finally just starting to produce some fruition, which is we're building an ultra small, uh, a, a ultra fast, small footprint backend for Daffodil that actually takes a DFDL format description and converts it to C code, to actually generate C code. Uh, and that project has the ambitions to generate actually FPGA logic for uh, hardware, in essence, logic from DFDL schemas for wire speed parse and unparse. So that's kind of exciting. The current backend is written in Scala and it's really, it's fast, but it's designed really more for correctness uh, than speed. Um, uh, and then finally, the whole purpose of having a standard data format description language is people can start to invest in the tooling more seriously because the tooling then has more universal usage across all the different frameworks and things that plug in Apache Daffodil. Uh, so the project just started to create a, um, uh, a, a plugin um, uh, uh, for uh, uh, integrated development environment. This particular project uh, is uh, using Eclipse right now. You should use Apache NetBeans, and I'd love to see that too. Um, and uh, but the idea is to have a, what I call a data format debugger, that something that gives you multiple panel view where you can see the data, you can see what it turns into when you parse it, uh, you can see the schema and you can interact with those pieces in order uh, to get your schema to parse the data properly or unparse it properly uh, and so forth and gives you a nice interactive capability to do that. Um, today we, we do this by, uh, we have a command line tool that comes with Daffodil that is the, the, the packaging of it that lets you use it sort of right away. So um, developers are wanted. Uh, develop, Daffodil is quite big and complex both good and bad. It means it's quite a learning curve. On the other hand, it's nice and meaty and exciting and fun to work on. And I worked on a compiler. You learn a lot about compilers. Um, it has this uh, pretty efficient low-level runtime and, of course, the C, new C runtime that is exciting and uh, uh, just coming out. You get to know or if you know or want to learn Scala. If you know or want to learn XML schema, these are things that we use heavily. Um, it is a pretty big code base. It's 295,000 lines of stuff. Uh, 107,000 lines of that are the implementation, Scala. Uh, something closer to 180,000 lines are test related. So uh, it's a, it's a mature, it matured solid code base with a lot of tests associated with it. I think uh, that speaks well to the seriousness that we uh, uh, we take the quality of the software with the team that are currently contributing. It's really quite a uh, uh, quite a nice thing to be able to show this pie chart. So we do need developers who are kind of undaunted by these challenges, who look at a big code base and they see opportunity as opposed to intim are intimidated by it, um, and who are motivated by data format problem once and for all. 
So with that, um, I actually have a little time for questions uh, and uh, happy to take them here in the chat. Uh, or you can reach me um, via mbeckerly at apache.org. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I hope you will browse the, uh, the um, Daffodil. Easiest place to start is the daffodilapache.org site. And from there, you can find your way to everything about Apache Daffodil and the DFDL standard and so forth. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll pause for questions. And uh, if you have any, type them in. I look forward to talking with you. Thank you very much. Looks like my video froze for a period of time. Of course, I'm hoping that you were looking at the slides, not me. Um, uh, but it's back now. I actually can wave to everybody. Okay, well, if there's no questions, I guess I'll wrap it up and you can go on to enjoy some more of the ApacheCon sessions. Uh, look forward to talking with people on emails or other chat channels. And thank you very much for, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, listening.